And now, ladies and gentlemen, not because I want to, but because I'm being paid to, I'd like to give you my interpretation of the death scene from All for Love. <laughs> Thank you. Courage, Cicero. Oh, Mortimer! Oh, Mortimer! Oh, Mortimer! Oh, Mortimer! and applause for Dora. I'll get her. Hey! Doris, you better get out there before Tony Tremaine gets mad and wrecks the place. Oh, a little waiting will do him good. He's gonna inherit a million bucks and you tell him to wait. Say, listen, he didn't buy the club tonight because he wanted me to entertain him. That's a cinch. Stop moving. For the queen. Did I forget to tell you how wonderful I think you are? No, you didn't exactly forget, Tony. But you only told me three or four times. Well, that's your fault. Every time I got up enough courage to tell you what was on my mind, you either had to sing or dance. You're sweet, Tony. <laughs> well, cut off my legs and call me shorty if you two aren't in love. Why don't you get married? Swell. Goldie, I think you got something there. Let's make it a wedding party, huh? <laughs> Maybe we ought to wait. Never put off till tomorrow what you can do tonight. I know all about when. I'll be right back, darling, as soon as I break the news to Vic. Ah, you've got to hand it to Doris. She's a fast worker. You don't have to tell me that, Vic. Didn't take a long to wrap you around a finger. Oh, yeah, but um, that that was before... <laughs> that was before you came to work for me. Sure of that? Uh-huh. I thought you were supposed to be the hostess around here, Mona, not the entertainer. Oh, but I had some business to talk over with her. The guests in the club are ready to leave. If it wouldn't be asking too much, she might bid them good night. Don't worry, I'll take care of the guests. Including young Tremaine. You sort of get around, don't you, Vic? Yeah, but you don't do so badly yourself. Young Tremaine's the catch of the season, you know. He was the catch. We're going to be married tonight. No. Yeah. Oh. Oh, hello, Hi, good evening. Hello, Sherwood. What's this I hear about getting married? Who is it, Tremaine the Third? You're a good guesser. Made up your mind rather sudden, didn't you? Maybe. But I'm fed up on this nightlife. The Tremaine family's not to be sneezed at. <laughs> no, no, the Tremaine money. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't, hey. <laughs> Where's the big event take place? In my apartment. Goldie and the gang are going with us. Well, to show you my heart in the right place, I'll send up the food. Your kindness is only overshadowed by your sweet disposition, Vic. So long. <laughs> oh, what a break for us, Dan. We'll clean up on this deal. I don't get you. Doris is marrying Tony to stay married. Yeah, that's what she thinks. You're going to have the opportunity of putting on the father act. And soon. But won't Doris object? Well, you leave that to me. We'll start the ball rolling by tipping off Tony's father in the newspapers. good company. Take it easy, Dick. If you don't want to drink, you don't have to. I'll drink it. Here's to you, kid. Hey, gang, food! <laughs> 
Why don't you all go home? Well, they haven't finished eating yet, Tony. And we're not going until we do. Wedding banquets like this don't grow on trees. That's right. I'll say it, Tony. You're right. Come on, let's give the bride. Say, that's an idea. Let me get another one. Oh, How did you know where to find me? Why shouldn't I know where to find you, you idiot? Every newspaper in town was tipped off that you had a loaf with a cheap nightclub dancer. Doris isn't a cheap nightclub dancer, and you can't talk like that about Oh, I can't, can't I? Don't forget I'm your father, and I've talked this matter over with my attorney, and instructed him to file a novel proceedings first thing in the morning. Mr. Tremaine, I think you are very ill-mannered. You keep out of this, young lady. I won't keep out of it, and I won't let you insinuate things against Doris. My family is just as good as yours. Please, Julie. I'm sure that Mr. Tremaine will eventually be convinced I'm not a cheap person. Oh, don't worry, darling. I won't let anyone take you away from me. If you finish what you have to say, Father, please leave. When I leave this place, you go with me, whether you like it or not. If you don't, I'll disinherit you and cut you off. Tell him to go take a running jump in the lake, Tony. If he disinherits you, I'll get you a job as a bartender. Add a girl. Step over here where I can photograph you telling him off. There'll be no more pictures. that last phone call. Outrage, officer. You can't arrest me. I'm Anthony Tremaine the second. I don't care if you're Cleopatra the fifth. Get going. <laughs> Better give a nice man to the phone when you're in enough trouble already. You don't want to get arrested for burglary. Come on, come on. <laughs> Figure the situation outdoors. Here you sit perfectly calm, and after what happened last night. How do you expect me to act? Do you think I ought to be weeping and wailing all over the place? Well, you certainly ought to show some concern. You marry a man you apparently love. Then his father insults you and threatens in a moment. A riot starts, and you spend the night in jail. I don't know, but that certainly sounds to me like reason enough for a few tears. There are some things you don't understand, Julie. This isn't Coffeeville. I'll say it isn't. A girl in my position can't afford to buck the whims of the social 400, Julie. When I married Tony, I had no idea I was going to have to take on the whole Tremaine clan. If he hasn't enough gumption to stand on his feet and stick up for his wife, there's nothing I can do about it. Well, I know one thing. If it was my husband that had been taken away from me so suddenly and roughly, I'd pick at the Tremaine home until I got him back. Look, Julie, did you come here to worry about my affairs? Oh, I'm sorry, sis. If I'm not here when you get back, I'll be at the club. You're not going back there. Why not? That's my work. Oh, 
<laughs> Hello, Doris. Hello, Dan. <laughs> You're looking swell. Last night didn't get you down, eh? Why should it? Has the Tremaine lawyer phoned yet? Why, no. That's good. I came up to offer my services. You know, take care of the business end. Why do I need your help? Uh, sit down, I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> the police taking you and young Tremaine to the city Bastille last night couldn't have worked out better if I'd staged it myself. <laughs> I'm going to collect plenty for you. You know, uh, damaged reputation, broken heart, things and stuff. <laughs> Fine scandal you've got me into. Well, it's not my fault, Dan. I didn't ask you to come up to Doris's apartment. Well, there's only one way out of this entire mess. You've got to call Doris Starr and tell her that she'll have to let you sue for an hour. You were drinking when you married her and didn't realize what you were doing. But Doris won't agree. I know she loves me and I love her. That's beside the point. Legally, you have excellent grounds for an annulment. But I don't want an annulment. I don't care what you want. You do as I say. Hello. Yes. This is Doris Starr. My name is Johnson, Stanley Johnson, legal advisor to Anthony Tremaine the third. To come right to the point, Miss Starr, how much will you take not to contest his annulment proceedings? What do you mean, how much will I take not to contest an annulment? I married Tony because I loved him, and I'm going to stay married to him. Just because I happen to work in a nightclub, you think I'm not good enough for the Tremaine. Well, listen to me, Mr. Johnson. I'm married to Tony and... I understand all that. I won't consent to an annulment. I won't give up my husband. He belongs to me and neither you nor anyone else. <laughs> Who do you think you're talking to anyway? Making my daughter cry like this. You ought to be ashamed of yourself trying to break a poor girl's heart. It's the girl's father. She became hysterical and he's on the phone now. Regardless of all that, uh, Tony Tremaine wants to have his marriage annulled as quickly as possible. I realize the fight in your daughter's apartment and the jail episode was an unfortunate occurrence. And we're willing to offer any uh, reasonable settlement. Your offer of a reasonable settlement and my daughter's damaged reputation may not coincide. I don't want your client in my family. But if my daughter's willing to accept adequate compensation for her broken heart, it's all right with me. We're not admitting anything. However, if you can persuade your daughter, I may be able to induce my client to consider uh, uh, 25,000. <laughs> it's not enough. I've already talked the matter over with my lawyer, and either the Tremaine family pays off plenty or we'll sue for a million. And if you don't think we've got a good case, better read a few more law books. Hello? Hello? He hung up on me. Well, I'll pay him off and let's get it over with. That's not going to be easy. You said Doris started crying over the phone and got hysterical? Well, don't you see, Dad? She still loves me. Oh, uh, Tommy Rod. She's probably a good actress. Her kind don't know the meaning of the word love. Well, how much is it going to cost us? My offer of 25000 didn't make a dent. Her father started raving about suing for a million. A million? Why, it's outrageous. It, it's preposterous. Offer of 50,000, that's enough. Why, this is nothing but blackmail. That's what it is. I'll tell you, partner. I'm plumb disgusted with Snake Eye. Why, that dirty old laundry, I'll tell you what he did to me. I was going down the river. No, you don't, partner. I got you. I got you covered. Just make one move for your shooting eye, and it's going to be your last. Savvy? Howdy. Takes care of the talking in the old bar nothing ranch. Oh, 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 excuse me. Uh, excuse me, boss. Uh, it's me, all right. Have you done what I told you? Oh, yes. I, oh, yes, sure. I got everything. I got the Western Magazine, a big map of Texas, the big hat, the high boots. Sure, why, I've been practicing all afternoon. All right, then. You'll find him at the Windsor Manor Apartment Hotel, Apartment 404. That's his brother-in-law's apartment. Carter and my daughter are out of town. Now, it's up to you. Oh, excuse me, sir. I reckon I came to the wrong ranch. I was looking for Mr. and Mrs. Carter, sir. Oh, well, this is their apartment, but my sister and her husband are out of town. Well, I'm mighty sorry to miss them. 
I came all the way from Texas just to see him. You know, Mr. Carter, he's an old pal of mine, sir. Oh, well, well come on in. Well, sir, I don't mind if I do. These city streets sure hurt my feet. Yes, sir. Well, go on, take your boots off. Make yourself right at home. Thank you, sir. I ain't used to walking much. Oh, here, let me help you. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm Steve Randall from Oklahoma. I'm Tex Cassidy from the Panhandle. I have a hundred thousand cattle there. You muffed that one, but take it over again. No wonder they hurt your feet. Ah, I wonder. Thank you, sir. Been in town long? Oh, just long enough to get in a fight with a couple of newlyweds and get thrown in jail. <laughs> but they released me as soon as they learned their mistake. Well, you got yourself in a lot of excitement, didn't you? You know, I should have been with you, Steve. I ain't been in a real good fight since down in Texas. I got in with old Snake Eye down in Skeleton Gulch. <clears throat> you know what he did to me? He tried to get right behind me and pot shoot me. Yes, he did. Well, I guess things are a little more peaceful down in Oklahoma, Tex. <laughs> Well, judging from these shooting eyes, you're just plumb modest. Seems to me I uh, used to hear of a man by the name of Randall. If I remember correctly, they called him Wild Bill Randall. Tell me he was the toughest marshal to ever pulled a shooting iron. Then I heard that uh, he was elected governor or something. That's right. He's my father. Those were his guns. <laughs> well, Steve, it's just going to be like old home week with you in town. Say, what do you say we team up and corral a few points of interest? Been to any nightclubs? Oh, not yet. I figured I'd get around to those later on. Have you been to any? Oh, yeah, I've been to two or three. Steve, they sure trot out some beautiful girls for you to look at. <laughs> Say, let us take in that tropical inn tonight. Say, it's real good. Good evening. Oh, good evening, ma'am. Table for two. Well, thank you. That'll be good for a start. But we may end up with a nightclub before we're through. Come this way, please. Thank you. Gee, that glamagoon Mona is sure dumb. That Steve Randall she just gave a go by to. The young man from the great outdoors just came in. what you want? <laughs> yes, indeed. Say, what are you doing for the next two weeks? <laughs> you wouldn't understand if I told you. Don't pay any attention to him, ma'am. He's from the West and doesn't know any better. It seems I've heard of that place where men are men and the empty spaces are above the neck. <laughs> <laughs> Say, she's a right for little Billy, ain't she, Steve? <laughs> I'll have a lemonade with a lot of ice. Lemonade? Well, I never thought I'd get to see the day when an old cowhand from Oklahoma would stoop to drinking that kind of stuff. Say! You want to take it straight? <laughs> you, know, you know a funny thing, but the, the Randalls have always been sort of allergic to alcohol. Not that they had any objection to drinking, but every time they did, they always got a little lightheaded. Oh, other folks can drink and don't bother them none. Well, I guess the Randalls were just lightheaded to begin with. I think that's what old granddaddy used to say. <laughs> His old grandpappy sure knew what he was talking about. I'll take beer. You would. Well, sir, I reckon it's quite a old day they got here, Steve. It's all right. Oh. <laughs> oh, pardon me, Mr. Randall. I, I recognized you when you came in. I thought I'd come down and introduce myself. Yeah? Well, I'm Vic Monroe, owner of the club. Oh, glad to know you, Mr. <laughs> Well, sir, I don't want to appear greedy, but I'd sure like a knockdown for that little mistress of ceremony. Well, I think that can be arranged. I've been trying to place the other girl. Who is she? Well, it's Julie Cavanaugh, Doris Starr's sister. She's not an employee of the club, but I think I can have you meet her. Well. Oh, uh, those two cowboys want to meet you. Why not? You mind, Miss Cavanaugh? Oh, Julie doesn't mind having come over. Jordy 
Cavanaugh, Miss Goldine Duval. May I present Mr. Steve Randall and... Uh... Just call me Tex. Tex Cassidy, sir. I believe Mr. Randall and I met last night, although we weren't formally introduced. That's right. We were motoring together in the throw wagon. Steve, you old rascal! <laughs> meet a couple of friends of Mr. Monroe's. Mr. Randall and Mr. Cassidy, Miss Starr. How do you do? How do you, How do, you do? do? Julie, I'd like to talk with you for a few moments. Of course. Will you excuse us? Well, yes, miss. Surely. Sit down. Plant yourself. She'll be back in a few minutes. Maybe her sister didn't like us coming to your table. Oh, she'll be all right. She's a little upset about what happened last night. Oh. Are you a real Westerner? You don't look like one with your hat off. <coughs> Why, Miss Goldie. I'll run a hundred thousand head of cattle down on the old panhandle. I didn't know they made pans that big. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you getting acquainted with men that come into this club. But Steve Randall seems like a perfect gentleman. Besides, it was Vic Monroe that brought him over to the table. I know. I saw what went on. And I still don't like it. Hiya. Buy yourself a house and lot. Oh, there's Anthony Tremaine the third. I hope he doesn't start any trouble. He looks a little tipsy. Hello, Doris. Hi, Julie. Hello, Tony. Sit down. I just thought I'd stop by and tell you how sorry I am about what happened last night. You ought to be sorry. However, there's no use discussing the matter further. It's over with. Well, you're not going to take my father seriously, are you? After all, I don't want to break up our marriage. Listen, Tony, your father broke up our marriage, and you weren't man enough to prevent it. You walked out on me in court this morning and followed the great Anthony Tremaine Sr. home like a little whipped pup. You mean you want to go through with the annulment? I mean just that. I don't want any part of your family. <laughs> That's a laugh. I should have believed what my father and Johnson said about you. They told me you only married me to work a blackmail racket. See here, you can't talk like that about Doris. Oh, sit down. This doesn't Keep concern. Keep your hands off, Julia, or I'll have you thrown out. Go ahead and try it. Now that you've roped me in and figured my old man will pay off, you talk big. But I'm wise to you. The lady said to get out. Better do as she says. Well, so the ex-governor's son has fallen for my wife, huh? Well, you can have her. You're... <laughs> Let go! Nobody's gonna knock me down to get away with it. Get more than that if you don't leave quietly. Take him outside and put him in a cab. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry I lost my temper. Where I come from, men were taught to respect women. Thanks, Steve. I'm very grateful too, Mr. Randall. Come on, Julie. Listen, Vic, let's have an understanding. I don't want my sister meeting any of your patrons like last night. Why, are you trying to keep her hidden from the rest of the world? Yes, as far as you and your rackets are concerned. Cool off, darling. I'm not interested in your sister or her friends. Don't kid me. I know you too well. You figure Steve's father would pay off plenty to keep him out of a scandal. Well, I'm just interested in protecting Julie. Get it? Oh, no, wait a minute. Let's not get into an argument today. <laughs> Why, as a matter of fact, we should be happy and celebrate. The Tremaine family is willing to pay off to the tune of $50,000. 50000 Night's going, huh? Why are you so interested in having a marriage in old Vic? Because I love you. Darling, I want to marry you. You really mean that? You're not just building me up for another letdown. This time, I really need it. Oh, uh, you ought to be in the office of Tremaine's attorney at 2.30. Just about have time to make him sign in an arm and papers and get to the bank before it closes. I don't know why I have to like a no good two-timer like you, but I do. Stay right there, Mr. Starr. 
You girls should be accustomed to signing papers like this. I guess it's one of the penalties we have to pay for being in the spotlight. Seems to me Monroe should organize a club among his showgirls, a professional marriage club. Why don't you talk to Mr. Monroe? You might be able to handle the legal business for the club. That's an idea. Two or three of his girls are always tangled up in annulment or divorce proceedings with some scatterbrained playboy. On second thought, though, I'd rather stay on the outside of the bars looking in. There's your check signed by Tremaine Sr. I'll call the bank and have it verified. That's very considerate of you. Fifty thousand is a lot of money, Miss Starr. Don't spend it all in one place. Thanks for the advice. You know Doris Pete. You know what a swell girl she is. I don't care what my old man or anyone else says. I'm still off my bean about her. I wouldn't take it too hard, Tony. But if you keep on carrying the torch, you'll have to get someone to scrape the tallow off your arms. Well, aren't you even going to say hello to me, Doris? I don't know why I should, after what you said about me last night. I know, and I'm terribly sorry. I didn't mean to talk like that. Look, if you'll forgive me, and at least be friends, I'll come back here tonight to the club and apologize to you in front of the whole gang. I believe you would at that, Tony. I'll always like you. There's no reason why we can't be friends. Oh, you're a peach. Will you come over and have a little drinky with me so we can talk a while? Uh, I promise I won't say anything I shouldn't. All right. I'll join you as soon as I see Vic Monroe. Well, you're a darling. like I should have knocked three times and then counted ten. Well, it is customary to knock before entering a private office. I wasn't talking to you. Oh, uh, well, listen, darling, Don't I... call me darling. I wouldn't believe you again if you made a promise on a stack of Bibles as high as the Washington Monument. I'm going to return that Tremaine money and quit this town for good. And I'm taking Julie with me. What do you mean you're going to return the money? If you're leaving town, it's okay with me, but I want that cash. You're going to have to want a long time. I think you ought to split that money with Vic. Who asked you to put in your 10 cents worth? So long, lovebirds. I said I want that cash. <laughs> you don't think I'd be foolish enough to carry it around with me, do you? Look, darling. I'll make a deal with you. We'll uh, split 50-50, huh? And no hard feelings? No, thanks. That money goes back to the Tremaines. And if you try to stop me, I'll do enough talking to put you away for a long time. Let's go someplace where we can have a little more privacy. Suits me. Hello, Tony. Hi, Vic. Not leaving so soon, are you? Well, Doris and I thought we'd... Uh, Find leave. a more private place to do our talking. Well, how about a last drink on the house? You know, just for luck. So, but only one. A round of drinks for me and my friends, Pete. What? What do you have, Doris? Nothing. Tony? Bourbon highball. Yeah, and put an extra shot in it. This is a big occasion. He and Doris have just made up. <laughs> okay, Vic. I'll give him something to remember us by. I wish you wouldn't do any more drinking, Tony. You've had enough. Oh, another little one won't hurt. Anyway, Vic's my friend. I can't refuse him. You used to be the one that never let his glass stay empty. What are you up to now, Doris? You ought to know. Oh, uh, <clears throat> Success and happiness to both of you. Come on, Tony. We. Oui. Well, oh, many thanks for the drink, Vic. Cheerio. Pleasure was all mine. <laughs> oh, I feel kind of sick. Dopey. I guess I shouldn't have had that last drink. Oh, I feel like the walking dead. You'll be all right, Tony. I'll fix you some black coffee. I guess I need it, Doris. Oh, I... I want you to know that this annulment business wasn't my idea. I know, Tony. I'm really the one to blame. Tony, here's the money your attorney gave me today. I'm returning it. I...
kept trying to tell my dad you weren't a gold digger. I want you to give them this money. Then maybe he'll be... I wouldn't call anyone if I were you, Doris. This is the last double cross you'll ever pull, darling. You've got to listen. Vic! I didn't kill Doris. I know they found me with a gun in my hand, but I wouldn't have harmed her for anything in the world. I loved her. I'd been drinking, and I passed out almost as soon as we got into the room. You've got to believe me, Julie. I do believe you, Tony. That's why I'm here. I thought perhaps you could give me some information that would help me trace the real murderer. I've got to find out who killed my sister. But I told everything I knew at the inquest. If your father hadn't threatened all sorts of countersuits because of the trouble at the apartment, I might have been able to stop the annulment. My father threatened to sue you? Why, I haven't any father. He died when Doris and I were children. But I don't understand. A man who said he was Doris' father got on the phone and raved about the damage to his daughter's reputation. He threatened to sue for a million dollars if we didn't pay off. About what time in the morning did this conversation take place? About 11.30, I imagine. I gave Doris's phone number to Johnson, and he called her while we were there. Don't say anything about this until you hear from me again. Maybe I can help you. I don't know what to say, Julie. I only hope that someday I'll be in a position to do something for you. You never can tell. I'm not trying very hard. Nah, feeling kind of tough, huh? Gee, it sure looks like Tony's going to the chair in spite of his old man's dough. I don't believe Tony's guilty. Well, the evidence is sure all against him. That's true, Goldie. But there are still a lot of things that haven't been explained. What happened to the $50,000 Tony claimed Doris gave him just before he passed out? Search me. Maybe he was lying when he said Doris invited him to her apartment to return the money to him. The district attorney's office must think he's guilty, otherwise they wouldn't hold him without bail. Goldie, I have a feeling Tony Tremaine was framed. How long did my sister work for Vic Monroe? Oh, I don't know, about three or four years. You don't suppose he had anything to do with her death, do you? Oh, you're balmy. Why, Vic was in love with Dora. Then why did she marry Tony? Mm -hmm, I don't know. Everybody around the club seemed to think he was that way about your sister. I may be a little hick from Kansas, <laughs> but two and two does make four. And I don't believe that this is the first annulment case that Vic has been mixed up in. I like you, Julie. So I want to give you a little advice. Kiss this town goodbye and go back to Kansas. Uh -oh. Looks like business is picking up. <laughs> well, if it isn't the big boss himself with his shadow. Hello, Miss Cavanaugh. Hello. Uh, have you met Mr. Sherwood? He's an associate of mine. How do you do? <laughs> How do you do? Julie's going to share the apartment with me, moving in tomorrow. She's been kind of lonesome. Lonesome? I thought that young Westerner from Oklahoma was taking care of that. Oh, I see Steve occasionally. Come on, Vic. I was just going to make some coffee. You can help me. <laughs> what is this wink? Look. Julie's been asking a lot of funny questions. I thought if I got her to move in with me, I could talk her into going back to Coffeeville. Ah, don't be foolish. What, lose a good thing? Are you cuckoo? No, but Steve Randall is, about her. If we use our heads, we'll be able to take us farther for plenty. Uh-uh. She's too smart, and besides, she likes the kid. Oh, she does. <laughs> Listen, sweetheart, I never met a girl yet that I wasn't able to swing over to my way of thinking. Well, 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 my, but you're domestic. Tell me about Cassidy. You gonna land him? I haven't failed yet, have I? No, but, uh... I'll bet you 50 on it. 
I'll take that bet. You're a flat. I learned a lot of new angles from Doris Dahl that I've been saving for just such an occasion. You know, whenever she got her hands on any big dough, she made copies of the serial numbers. I never thought she was that clever. Clever? Say, Doris always said that if she was ever double-crossed, she was going to be the one to crack the whip. I'd hate to be in the gent's shoes that tries to get rid of that missing 50,000. Mr. Sherwood, weren't you in my sister's apartment when the Tremaine attorney called about the annulment? <laughs> Why, uh, I believe I was. Wonderful girl, Doris. Wonderful. I loved her like a daughter. <laughs> so I understand. You even told Stanley Johnson, the Tremaine attorney, that you were her father. Well, uh, <laughs> I might have given that impression, Miss Kavanaugh. I was so angry and upset when Doris, poor child, uh, became hysterical on the telephone and couldn't talk intelligently. <laughs> I wonder what they're doing out there. I really could go for a good cup of coffee. <laughs> I don't like this setup. That girl worries me. What's the matter now? Miss Kavanaugh, she worries me. <laughs> Take it easy. I know what I'm doing. Uh, I hope so. How about some coffee for me? Well, I might be able to do better than that. Goldie tells me you haven't had much luck finding a job. No, I haven't. Well, uh, I need a cigarette girl, and you need a job. Tell me, can you dance or sing? Oh, I sing a little. Well, then you've got a job.
stroll alone down the avenue. Everyone I meet seems to know it through. I'm feeling blue. I need your arms about me. I need the thrill of your kiss. I never thought you'd doubt me and leave me alone like this. Alone again, alone again, and it's all your fault. I'm alone again, I'm put loose and out on my own again, but I'm alone. Home a souvenir to your folks, mister. It'll make them happy. You think I'd be here if I had any folks? I came here to forget I was lonesome. Thought I might be able to buy a little happiness. Got the money to pay for it. Oh, well, you've got a lot more than I've got. I, I can't even try to buy happiness. Well, that's too bad. I'm sorry. Did, did I make you cry? No. I, I was just thinking about my mother. She's an invalid, and I don't make enough money here to even take care of her. Well, baby, I can help you. I'm not exactly wealthy, but I'm, I'm not a poor man. <laughs> Hello, boys. Hello, Vic. Brody, see what the boys want. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I'll see you later. I've got to wait on the customer. What's the matter with Julie? She looks like she's been crying. She probably got to thinking about Doris. She took her sister's death pretty much to heart. Well, uh, when did Julie start peddling cigarettes here? Tonight. She had to go to work, so Vic gave her a job. How are the cows getting along, Tex? What cows? Oh! <laughs> you mean the hundred thousand head of cattle I have down in the panhandle? Well, I reckon they're plum content. You must have to get up pretty early to milk them. <laughs> they're not milk cows, Goldie. They're beef steers. Well, well, I don't get it. Excuse me. Come in. What kind of a line were you handing that old man out there? He was so lonesome, I could have sold him Rockefeller Center. Well, Judy, I'm rather surprised at you. You needn't be. You don't suppose I can live off the money I make, do you? Besides, I took this job to get back at the rich playboys that were responsible for what happened to Doris. Oh, well, uh... How would you like to make some really big money, huh? I'm listening. Steve Randall's falling for you, you know. If you're smart, you can marry him. And then what? Then his father will pay off plenty to have the marriage annulled. <laughs> Do you think you can get away with a thing like that? Well, you leave it to me. I know just how to handle it. Oh. And, uh, what do I get out of it? Oh, well, that depends on the size of the settlement. Probably around 10%. If I marry Steve Randall, I want 50% of the payoff. What? Hey, wait a minute. I've got to take care of the attorney and Sherwood out of my split. That's your tough luck. 50% or no marriage. To be on. You didn't tell me you were going to work here, Julie. I didn't know it myself until this afternoon. That's a right nice number, that orchestra playing, Miss Julie. Yes. Speaking of numbers, maybe you can help me. I found this in Doris's apartment this afternoon while I was packing. Oh, they look like lottery numbers. Steve, do you mind if I take a little peek at that? Did Doris ever play the lottery? Not that I know of. Looks like the old numbers racket to me, Julie. Sit down, sit down. I know you're a gentleman. I just want to know if Mr. Tex Cassidy would like to do a little shin cracker. <laughs> you really got an old shin cracker, Goldie. <laughs> Hello, 
I wish you didn't have to work here, Julie. Well, I can't starve to death. Perhaps if I stay here long enough, I'll, I'll meet someone who'll fall in love with me and take me away. You know, how they tell about in storybooks. You found that person already, Julie. Oh, I've been in love with you since the first night I met you. I, I guess I feel the same way about you, too, Steve. Only, I, I was afraid to even think about it. You're the nicest girl in the world, Julie. Will you marry me? Well, if you two aren't cooking up a romance, I don't know nothing about love. Steve and I are going to be married, Gold. I thought so. Congratulations to you both. Hi, hi, yippee! <laughs> Let me offer my kindest regards, Steve. Isn't it wonderful, Tank? <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> Why not make it a double wedding? Uh, 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 oh, well, uh, <laughs> this little girl doesn't think of me in that way. Steve, what's the matter with you? Oh, yes, I do, Texie Wexie. You're adorable. <laughs> Oh, double wedding, splendid! You know, I, uh, I specialize in double weddings. I even give a discount. Well, we're not interested in that. We yes. just want to get married. Let's just oh. get on with the ceremony. Oh, all right, all right. Then let me see your licenses, eh? And then and I'll call for the witness. That's it. <laughs> there we are. Now just get your rings and, and join hands. Do you, Julia Cavanaugh? And Goldine Duval, take these two men to be your lawful wedded husbands, to love, to honor, and cherish them until death do you part? I do. I do. And do you, Stephen Randall and James Cassidy, take these two women to be your lawful wedded wives, to love, to honor, protect, until death do you part? I do. I do. Put on your rings. And now, by virtue of my authority, as justice of the peace, I pronounce you married. Now you may sign here, please. Now, Claire, you and Maggie go out and get the luggage, and then you can sign as witnesses later on. That's the... Now, just follow me, please. I'll show you the turtle dove suite. Come right along. Now, this door leads to your apartment, and this one leads to your apartment. And I know that you'll be very comfortable and happy here. Thank you. Well, will you send up our baggage? Oh, yes, baggage, baggage. I know baggage. Well, I guess we're in the way here. <laughs> oh, a love scene. Well, aren't you going to take off your hat and stay a while? Oh, Texas. Happy, darling. Steve. Julie! I don't know. She started to cry, and then without any explanation, she left me. Hey, Goldie, where do you think you'll go? I'm going to take care of Julie. Goodbye. Yo. Yo. Where'd you go? Well, that's that, Steve. I knew this would happen. What are you driving at, Tex? Why, Goldie and Julie have gone back to Vic Monroe. That's part of their racket. What racket? Why, your father's going to show up here in a little bit, and then Julie is going to sue you for an annulment. An annulment? Well, now listen, Steve. There are a lot of things about this that I should have you told you. You said enough about... already, Tex. Julie is my wife, and I'm not going to let anybody take her away from me. Now, Steve, look here. What? Oh. Mm. 
Where's my son? Your son? Yes, yeah, Steve Randall. Oh, you mean one of the new bridegrooms. Well, you'll find him right in that room, man. The turtle dove room, right over there. Oh, son. Son, where are you? Matter, Steve, can you find him? I am not Steve. Well, hello, boss. You certainly got here in a hurry. Well, I took a plane from Oklahoma as soon as I received the word about Steve getting married. Where is he? He's gone. His bride ran away and he's trying to find her. Well, I certainly let you know this time. I don't know about that. I checked on Julie Cavanaugh. That girl's all right. Oh, you mean you're not sore because Steve got married? Well, of course not. And you're not going to make him call off the wedding? Well, I know. I've been trying to get him married off for five years. <laughs> do him good. Make him settle down. Well, that sure stops me. Hey, what are you doing in this bridal suite anyway? Oh, I'm just another disappointed bridegroom. And Steve's wife left. My wife left with her. Yeah, well, I can't say that I blame her much for that. I agree with you. <laughs> well, that doesn't help me clinch the murder case I was on. Murder case? Yes. I've got the goods on Vic Monroe for the killing of Doris Cavanaugh. And listen, boss, you've got to help me. What can I do? I'll tell you what you can do. Listen. Mrs. Stephen Randall is my daughter. I demand to see her at once. Yeah, where's the bride? Oh, please, gentlemen, please. I'll have this marriage and all of it's the last thing I ever do. Where have I seen you before? You're Cassidy of the State Detective Bureau. Come what on. are you doing here? Forget it, son. You can quote me as saying I'm definitely opposed to my son's marriage to this cigarette girl. It's been a terrific blow to me. You're acting like a sap, Julie. Vic's not to let you get away with an act like that. You're I playing with dynamite. I can't help it, Goldie. I never realized how much I was in love with Steve until it was too late. Where's Vic? He's back in the office with Mona, checking over their seats. I didn't expect you back so soon. Did everything go all right? We didn't wait long enough to find out. Don't tell me you didn't get married. Oh, I married Steve, all right. But I'm not going through with the deal. Maybe you're not, but I am. Your walking out won't do a bit of harm. Not when the newspapers get through printing the heartbroken story your father tells them about the no good cowhand you married. You wouldn't do that to Steve. You know Sherwood is not my father. So, you really fell in love with Steve, eh? Why shouldn't I? I loved him the first moment I saw him. <laughs> I have a right to fall in love if I want to. No, you haven't, darling. I went into this thing to make money, and I'm going to get it. I was all set with Tex when she pulled that saw back and beat it. Oh, is Julie Cavanaugh here? You just wait, I'll find out. Steve Randall's in the house. He wants to see her. Tell him to come in. Here, take this. Keep him covered and let him have it if he tries anything. Oh. You stay here. You're going to tell Steve off. If you don't, he might meet with a little accident. Go on, you get out of here. No, wait a minute. You stay. I thought I'd find you here, Julie. Come on, you're going home with me. <laughs> oh, why don't you grow up? I never realized you were such a stupid hillbilly until after I married you. You didn't think up those words yourself, Julie. Who's giving you advice? Nobody has to give me advice. I know what I want, and it isn't you. You don't mean that. If she didn't mean it, she wouldn't say it. <laughs> Come on, Julie, I'm going to get you out of here. Get out. Get out! Don't you ever come back into this club again. Yes, that's what I say. Get out! Oh, I guess Cassidy was right when he told me all about you. I'll give you an element if you want it. I'll give it to you whatever it costs me. So long. I sure admire your choice of friends. Mona, take her in the dressing room and watch her. Come on. I've got 
talk to you, Steve. It's very important. I'm not interested. You did enough talking the last time. I know I did, but for a very good reason. All the time you were in Vic's office, Pete was in the next room covering you with an automatic. Pete? That's why Julie had to say what she did, otherwise it would have been too bad for you. Are you trying to tell me that Julie's just putting on an act for my benefit? You're a simpleton, Steve. Julie's in love with you and you ought to know it. Sure. She marries me because she loves me. Then because she loves me, she leaves me. Oh, I don't know. That doesn't make sense to me. She walked out because she didn't want to go through with the annulment that Vic and Dan Sherwood were planning. She thought Vic had something to do with her sister's death and only took a job with him to try and prove it. Where is she now? Still at the club and in a plenty tough spot. That's why I came after you. Say, you can't carry concealed weapons. You'll be arrested. They won't be concealed. Besides that, I have a permit to carry these any place in the United States. The last time I faced Monroe, he had an automatic. This time, it's going to be more even. Wow! What's the matter, Dan? You look worried. I am worried. Did Julie get back? Yeah, she's in the dressing room with Mona. She tried to pull a fast one. I huh? wouldn't doubt it. Tex Cassidy's a state detective. What? Are you kidding? I wish I were, but it's true. One of the reporters at Honeymoon Lodge recognized him. Well, that means that Randall and Julie are probably working with him. I told you not to trust that baby-faced Kavanaugh kid. Get Goldie. We've got to sneak Julie out of town and put her in a place where she won't do any talking. Right. Look, Mona, you know Vic isn't doing the right thing. You keep quiet. You're staying right here. Working with Cassidy, huh? I don't know what you're talking about. But this is the money that was stolen when Doris was murdered. You killed her. Did I? You think you're smart, don't you? Sit down. I beg your pardon. Put him up. Don't make any noise. Get going. Pretty, isn't it? <laughs> Vic! Vic! You ought to learn to shoot, Monroe. Did you ever hear of playing billiards with bullets? Reckon I'll have to demonstrate a carom shot. 
If I hit that champagne cooler, I'd have just clip your ear. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't hit a flock of wagon covers flying low with a machine gun. Let's get down to some fancy Oklahoma shooting. It's my turn now, Randall. You got more nerve than I thought you had, Monroe. But I'll give you an even break. I'd appreciate your kindness very much if I didn't know that your old-fashioned gun was empty. You fired six shots. I counted them. But I still have two bullets left in this automatic. Well, I reckon you got me. You overlooked one thing, Monroe. Back in Oklahoma, we packed two guns. Hi, Dad. How did you know where I was? It's a long story, son. Why, well, Goldie here located us down at the district attorney's office, didn't you? That's the money that was stolen when Doris was killed. I found the bills in Monroe's briefcase and compared them with the numbers that Doris had written down on the piece of paper. You mean the paper you showed Tex and me? Yes. Well, where is it now, Julie? He burned it. She doesn't know what she's talking about. I always keep a lot of money around the club. Let me see that money, officer. Steve. Is one of those serial numbers 963215? Yeah, here it is, Tex. Another number, 963718? Yeah, that's right. And is there another number, 963286? That's right. Say, how did you happen to know those numbers? Well, I'll tell you. When Julie showed them to Steve the other night, I memorized them. You know, I get paid for just doing that sort of thing. You mean you're a copper? He's one of the chief investigators for the state. I thought you were a millionaire cowman. Oh, Goldie. Don't tell me I had to fall for a guy with a nickel-plated badge. Goldie. Oh! Goldie. <laughs> <laughs>